Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me to present this interesting webinar on how to diagnose and treat VOD in 2021. These are my disclosures. Uh, when occlusive liver disease, or in other words, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, is a very challenging diagnosis. You can see here clearly on the slide weaknesses of old diagnostic criteria for children. For the diagnosis of VOD, when you used Baltimore criteria, you needed a presentation of bilirubin more than 2 mg per deciliter before day 21 post-transplant, and at least two of the following, painful hepatomegaly, ascites or weight gain uh, more than 5% uh, from the baseline. Uh, for the diagnosis of VOD, when you used modified Seattle criteria, you needed a presentation before day 20 post-transplant of at least two of the following, so bilirubin above 2 or hepatomegaly or right upper quadrant pain or weight gain more than 2%. So here in the Baltimore criteria, hyperbilirubinemia was essential, obligatory. In the modified Seattle criteria, no, but uh, uh, bilirubin was really an important uh, symptom for the diagnosis of VOD. Uh, Venoocclusive liver disease uh, is a disease which is different in pediatric population in comparison with adults. So, first of all, uh, many of patients have a late onset VOD uh, in children. It's really rare in adults. Furthermore, uh, how to assess the weight gain of 2 to 5 percent in children? In infants, it might be simply very inaccurate. Uh, furthermore, uh, in uh, pediatric patients, we have high rate of pre-existing hepatomegaly and ascites and, uh, because of the primary disease. So uh, this criterion is difficult here. Uh, as I told you, um, hyperbilirubinemia is not always present in children, so anecteric VOD is very common. How often, I will show you later. Uh, the incidence in children is quite high, up to 20 or sometimes even 60% in some high-risk patients, in comparison with 10% or less than 10% in adults. You can see here clearly on this graph uh, the impact of age on the occurrence of VOD. So infants uh, will develop uh, VOD uh, more frequently due to mostly liver immaturity. Furthermore, uh, you have a specific diagnosis uh, like osteopetrosis, like HLH, like neuroblastoma, thalassemia. Those patients are susceptible to VOD. Uh, in a recent paper by uh, Professor Ciorbaciolo uh, and colleagues, a um, uh, high rate of anecteric VOD in pediatric patients was shown clearly. You can see here 37% of patients without multi-organ failure who had anecteric VOD uh, at time of, di of diagnosis. And even uh, for patients with multi-organ failure, 18% of patients had bilirubin below 2 mg per deciliter at diagnosis. So, uh, in summary, you can see here that we have a very uh, specific situation in pediatric population. We have high incidence, we have additional pediatric risk factors, we have uh, different clinical presentation with late onset and anecteric VOD in 20-30% respectively. Uh, we have, uh, thanks God, very good results of treatment, so the fibrotide for severe SOS uh, in pediatric patients was associated with much better results than in adults. In, for prevention, the fibrotide also demonstrated efficacy uh, in a randomized prospective trial in pediatric patients. However, uh, this um, uh, prophylaxis is not registered uh, for the use of the, the fibrotide at the moment. 
Uh, let's have a look at uh, specific uh, disorders. Uh, well, osteopetrosis, this is a well-established high-risk disease with incidence of VOD up to 60%. Uh, we uh, used previously very toxic conditioning protocols, including busulfan. Now uh, we are changing the protocols into uh, less toxic regimens, including triosulfan, fludarabine, and thiotipa. However, of course, uh, the risk of those uh, reduced toxicity protocols is high rate of mixed chimerism, poor graft function, and of course, late graft rejection. Neuroblastoma. We have here a well-established pan-European protocol, Bucelf and Melphalan, uh, uh, and uh, we have here heavily pretreated children, mostly infants, uh, so the incidence is up to 30%, which is quite high. My personal observation, when we switched from oral to IV busulfan, we have uh, more VOD now because we don't do uh, PKs, we don't do uh, TDM. What about other conditioning regimens uh, for neuroblastoma? Triosulfan, melphalan, thiotipa is another protocol which may be used for uh, children relapsing post-transplant or for children with primary refractory neuroblastoma. So and even with this reduced intensity protocol, 18% uh, of children may develop VOD. These are our observations from our center. Thalassemia. Here the incidence is up to 20%. Uh, mostly due to iron overload and or liver fibrosis. Uh, however, it's decreasing now thanks to successful iron chelation, thanks to younger aged at transplant, so uh, patients will have less transfusions at transplant, and thanks to reduced toxicity regimens, including triosulfan, fludarabine, and thiotipa uh, protocols by Professor Locatelli from Italy. So, uh, for differential diagnosis of VOD, uh, we, uh, have take, uh, we have to take into account the large spectrum of endothelial injury-related complications. Uh, for instance, engraftment syndrome, uh, um, uh, thrombotic uh, uh, microangiopathy, um, TATMA, uh, acute graft versus host disease, chronic graft versus host disease, or capillary leakage syndrome. Uh, well, Professor Chorbachoglu proposed a new uh, diagnostic criteria for pediatric population of patients, and those uh, new EBMT VOD criteria are now approved, and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to present those criteria, which should be used now, uh, because they are really, really good. So you can see here clearly, there's no more limitation for time of onset of VOD. So uh, we have uh, many patients with late onset VOD and they are now in. What we need? We need the presence of two or more of the following symptoms. The first, which is very frequent in pediatric patients, unexplained consumptive and transfusion refractory thrombocytopenia. This is really crucial. Second, otherwise unexplained weight gain on three consecutive days despite the use of diuretics or a weight gain more than 5% above baseline value. Third, hepatemagaly above baseline value. Fourth, ascites, of course, best if confirmed by imaging above baseline value. And fifth, rising bilirubin from a baseline value on three consecutive days or bilirubin above two milligram per deciliter within 72 hours. So this is really crucial and we do use those criteria. Another important thing, um, uh, Professor Chorbachoglu proposed uh, new criteria for grading the severity of suspected hepatic VOD in children. And you can see them here clearly. It's really important because uh, we, um, uh, our perfect drug, the fibrotide, is registered for severe VOD, not for mild or moderate. So we, when we use it in the mild or moderate VOD, we use it off-label. So uh, the first important message from uh, this uh, table is that if the patient fulfills criteria in different categories, they must be classified in the most severe category. In addition, the kinetics of the evolution of cumulative symptoms within 48 hours 
predicts severe disease. Well, what about uh, transaminases? Uh, they, uh, if they are rising, they reflect hepatocyte failure and advanced stage disease. If we see elevation of GLDH, it may reflect severe hepatocellular damage. Uh, persistent refractory thrombocytopenia for more than seven days indicates really severe disease. This is important. A bilirubin, again, greater than or equal to 2 mg per deciliter defines severe VOD in children. That's important. And another important point, kinetics. Doubling of bilirubin from an individual baseline within 48 hours should be considered a sign of severe VOD. Another point. Need for paracentesis to release abdominal pressure is a criterion of severe VOD. And the need for replacement of coagulation factors after the established diagnosis of VOD indicates consumptive coagulopathy associated with hepatic failure. And uh, what about um, uh, multi-organ failure? If we have a severe VOD resulting in multi-organ failure, uh, then it's, of course, classified it classifies very severe disease. Uh, furthermore, a combination of two of the following criteria, here you can see persistent acidic drainage, persistent refractory thrombocytopenia, or sustained high levels of liver function indexes, or bilirubin uh, uh, above two milligram per deciliter, it all defines a very severe VOD and predicts for an increased risk of death and the need for prolonged treatment. Um, uh, we prospectively assessed uh, pediatric EBMT criteria for VOD diagnosis in our center, trying to answer the question, is it time saving or money wasting using the criteria? We uh, analyzed uh, almost 300 transplant procedures performed in our center in Wroclaw between January 2016 and March 2019, particularly focusing on patients diagnosed with, with VOD according to new criteria. Uh, our data we compared with results of previous VOD research conducted in our center during years uh, 2001 and 2015. So um, look at the incidence of VOD in our center. So the incidence was 9%. Uh, time of diagnosis, median 16 days. A bilirubin level at diagnosis, median 1.1, so far below 2 even maximum bilirubin level, median 1.6, still below 2. Ascites present in 20 out of 25 patients, weight gain and hepatomegaly in 23 out of 25 patients, and refractory thrombocytopenia present in all 25 patients. And this is really crucial. Uh, this is really interesting because when we looked at our patients who were diagnosed with EBMT criteria, 25 patients, they fulfilled Baltimore criteria only in six patients and only 16 patients fulfilled modified Seattle criteria. So diagnosis delay was here median three days and range up to 11 days. And we all know that even the one day delay significantly reduces patients' chances for survival. Uh, look at the uh, comparison of our new data versus old data from 2001, 2015, when we used modified Seattle criteria. So, uh, of course, a huge difference in medium serum bilirubin level, 1.2 versus 2.8. Uh, but we had much better response rate to defibrotide, 96% versus 74%, uh, much better overall survival, uh, much less transplant-related mortality, and so, so only one patient died uh, due to um, multi-organ failure with sepsis and with fatal VOD. So, and again, median length of hospitalization, also much shorter. So, uh, in conclusion, earlier VOD diagnosis facilitated by new EBMT pediatric criteria resulted here in implementation of immediate treatment and significantly improved patient's outcome. 
So furthermore, it allowed even shortening of defibrotide administration and minimized length of hospital stay. So the question is, would patients benefit from pediatric diagnostic criteria for VOD? Of course, the intention is increased sensitivity, but the risk is decline of the specificity. But when we look at the old criteria, so we are now um, happy to intervene earlier with effective drugs and uh, whether we are really sacrificing specificity for sensitivity, I would say no, with 30% of VOD occurring without hyperbilirubinemia, the specificity of Baltimore criteria in children is really questionable. Uh, what about prophylaxis? So, as I told you, uh, the fibrotide is not registered for prophylaxis, unfortunately. However, off-label, it may be used, for instance, for patients with osteopetrosis, and we do it. Uh, the only drug this is, this, which is recommended for prophylaxis is ursodexacolic acid, uh, which should be used from the beginning of the conditioning until day 90 post-transplantation. We have one excellent drug which is uh, working perfectly. This is the fibrotide. Uh, the dose is 6.25 mg per kg um, uh, in two hours infusion every six hours for at least 21 days according to SPC. Uh, and uh, this is the only drug uh, which is really registered. So we also use some kind of symptomatic treatment, uh, which is restriction of salt and water intake, uh, plus minus diuretics. However, we have to remember that we should maintain intravascular volume and renal perfusion by means of um, albumin, plasma expanders and transfusions, just to uh, avoid kidney injury. So other measures are listed here, include uh, analgesia, paracentesis when needed, hemodialysis when needed, and some surgical interventions when needed. Uh, the fibrotide uh, is a nice uh, mixture of uh, oligonucleotides derived from uh, porcine intestinal mucosal DNA. And uh, the primary therapeutic action of the fibrotide uh, includes uh, a reduction of endothelial cell activation and increase in fibrinolysis. And furthermore, uh, all those actions also improve hepatic microvascular circulation. When should we stop the fibrotide? That's the question. So, uh, according to uh, Professor Chorbacholiu, uh, dynamic criteria must be fulfilled. Why? Because they uh, reflect uh, more promptly the dynamics of sinusoidal recovery. And uh, so if we have the reduction of platelet refractiveness, if we have normalization of cargulopathy, we are happy that the drug is working and that the VOD recovers. Furthermore, uh, when we see uh, the reduction of the use of diuretics, the weight reduction and the reduced drainage from paracentesis, we might uh, believe that we uh, do have reversal of third spacing and endothelial leakage. Static criteria, they should be fulfilled, but definitely will take longer to recover, probably in the described order, like here, one, flow reversal, two, hyperbilirubinemia, three, hepatomegaly. In summary, VOD incidence in children has not decreased over the last decade, but thanks to new pediatric EBMT diagnostic criteria and appropriate treatment, the uh, risk of catastrophic outcome in high-risk patients with VOD may definitely decrease. And furthermore, the fibrotide remains a very effective non-toxic drug for the therapy of severe VOD. With the picture of Prague and uh, the site of the uh, next annual meeting of the ABMT, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.